Hey everyone, what's up? It is Denise Salcedo. Welcome back to Instinct Culture. And I am beyond, and I mean beyond, excited because today my guest is none other than Jake Atlas. Jake, welcome to my channel for the second time, actually. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, I when you reached out when you reached out to me uh, when everything happened, I couldn't be more ecstatic um, to kind of just realize that you and I kind of have this rapport and kind of like we've built this like unspoken bond. And I, I just think about how, you know, I think the last time we we did the interview was in 2019, right around when I had, I knew that I was going to WWE, but I couldn't say it. And um, I remember just uh, really enjoying your energy and your positivity and kind of just your professionalism, where you're not looking to kind of spin things and kind of get your own narrative. And, and I, I kind of just enjoyed that part of it. Um, and I'm really glad and stoked to be talking to you because I just feel like you yourself have grown so much. And, and, and this is the part that I wanted to make sure I got on the interview. Uh, I'm going to put over Denise a little bit. Um, I, again, met her in 2019 and in 2019, you know, I feel like we knew of each other, but like she kind of came out of nowhere in 2019 for me personally. She had she was probably already doing things with instinct culture and she was already into pop culture uh, interviewing and, and going to different award shows and stuff. But as far as wrestling goes, she was you were someone that was coming in to to it all. And to see your growth and see how much you've you've kind of done for yourself. I don't know. I have a soft spot because we're both from LA and we are very similar in, in dreams and aspirations. And I'm just, I'm really excited to chat with you and, and I'm, you're the only person I want to talk to. So uh, let's make it happen. You're let's do it. make me cry, Jake. Like literally, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Like I like just hearing you say all of this is because I kind of like, I feel like the exact same way. Like, you know, you mentioned that, you know, I kind of feel like we, we really hit it off and it was so funny yeah. because when we did our first interview right before you signed with WWE, I think it was probably like a couple weeks or I think like that following week, like they had a show here in Los Angeles. Angeles, and I believe yeah. you were backstage during that time. So it was kind of like, it all happened so fast. But it was so funny, because prior to that, we, you know, we kind of met because we were working on shows together. And I remember that, you know, I had been doing interviews with people. And the funniest thing was that you told me that day during that interview that you thought I didn't want to interview you. And I was like, <laughs> Dude, I was like, I honestly was not even sure because I was so nervous to like during that point, like I was still, you know, building relationships. And I don't think right. a lot of people realize that I am actually a little bit shy in person. So like, I'm always polite, but I'm a little bit shy to reach out to people. So that was one of those things where I was like, oh, my God, he thought I didn't want to interview him. But in reality, I was too scared to ask him. Aww. And it was so funny because, yeah, like I do feel like, you know, being from the home, you know, being from the same place and, you know, kind of, you know, just I feel like we share a good um, mentality of things and that's why like yeah. I will tell you, like, I feel like, and I will get into this a lot more, but like, I have been like rooting for you and just like so excited for everything that you've been doing, because here's the thing. And I've said this so many times on some of my podcasts where I'm like, I've been right next to Jake Atlas. Like I've been there. I've ring announced him. I've experienced, you know, him walking out. I've experienced you and your energy and the connection that you have with the crowd and the people on your shows. I've seen your matches. I've marked out during some of your matches <laughs> or actually all of the ones that I've seen, you know, in different places, whether it be in, you know, PCW Ultra, Suburban Fight and, you know, so many of those other shows. And it was just right. absolutely like I, I just kept telling my I kept telling, you know, the viewers you guys you haven't even you haven't even fully been exposed to everything that right. i think jake atlas can do so right. let's kind of get into this you know interview. Yeah. I know there's going to be so much that i kind of want to touch on and i know just you know kind of give everybody here that's listening a little heads up i did tell you you know off the air that i really want this to be authentically you and your story and your experience like you mentioned i don't want to spin any sort of narrative here or anything like that. I want it to be your true authentic experience. So, um, you know, I kind of want to get into some of the more of the recent stuff before we backtrack a little bit and talk about, you know, the big elephant in the room. But before yeah. that, I here's the thing. So today I tweeted this out because it's been behind my mind is that every single time I log into like to my Twitter feed or I go check the wrestling news sites or anything like that, 
one of the main things that I've been seeing is Jake Atlas has been added to this card. Jake Atlas has been added to that card. And so like, just to kind of recap a little bit here, and I hope I got everything, but you have uh, the New Japan, you were announced for the New Japan showdown that's going to be happening in this October, making yeah. your debut. This past weekend, you defeated Effie on his show in yeah. GCW, and you're going to be in PWG uh, later this month for their show. And then you also were just announced for, uh, for Ring of Honor Death Before Dishonor facing T Taylor Russ so kind of talking a little bit about all of those shows that you're going to be doing tell me how you feel right now knowing that you have all of these things lined up I feel a little bit I feel excited that it's all out I'm very much someone who likes to just um I'm very superstitious although that's something a lot of people don't know about me I'm very superstitious maybe the Mexican culture in me, but I'm very like, don't speak, don't, you know, everything you say comes to life or it, or if you say it, it may not happen. Um, and so I think just as soon as everything went down on the 6th of August, I just started moving and I, uh, I, you know, got connected with a lot of people and I'm very grateful to have made so many connections within wrestling and in, in really the short amount of time that I was on the independent scene just being able to create the connections to be able to hit the ground running right off the bat as soon as my non-compete was over. Um, and I'm just ecstatic. I'm ecstatic that people can see that I'm not playing around. Like I'm not going to, you know, sit around. I wasn't twiddling my thumbs and just expecting people, expecting something to happen. I knew all along there was, there is a plan and there is a plan and, and, and it's all going to unravel slowly. And I'm just, you know, it was, it's crazy. I didn't, I didn't know that everything was going to happen this week. Um, but I should have had an idea because, you know, uh, like Rocky Romero, who was my connection with New Japan, had asked me, like, when am I allowed to announce you? And it just, that stuff like that just makes me feel good because it obviously just means that they're excited to have me as well. And so to have it all go down this week was really, really cool because it just, I, I want people you know, the new fans that I've made, because WWE is, is to a whole, it's a big audience. I want to grab those fans and be like, come with me, come on this journey and look at what, what is there to offer, you know? Um, new Japan was somewhere that I didn't get to do uh, before I signed with WWE. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that. Uh, and then Ring of Honor, actually, the one appearance I did was a year ago, I'm sorry, two years ago in September for the same pay-per-view um, when I already knew that that I was heading to WWE. So it's all kind of full circle. And I'm, I'm really excited that people are starting to see like what I'm going to be doing so that they can also be excited and, and hopefully attend the shows. Yeah, and that's the thing too, is though that you essentially, you're used to being like this kind of person, this go-getter. And hey, I'm going to, you know, because prior to going to WWE, you were making the rounds. You were doing yeah. absolutely everything that it took. So, you know, just kind of you, you honestly going and working for all of these promotions right now does not surprise me, like not even a little bit whatsoever. Right, right, right. right. I mean, I, I, I knew what I wanted and I had a vision of how I wanted this you know, return or comeback, whatever you want to call it, this continuation. Um, I knew how I wanted it to go. And I'm just I'm happy that it's happening in this way. I am happy for you, too, especially like I also saw your your video where you were, you know, announcing that you were going to be on Effie's big gay yeah. brunch. And you were like, I'm in the mood for a big gay brunch. I was yeah. like, oh, hell yeah. Like, this is so dope. And so, you know, just to kind of see like all of, I think all the announcements kind of happening around the same time, kind of just really, I think, like the outside, per, you know, the outside perspective If I'm somebody like, you know, looking from the outside in. I'm looking like, yeah. you know what? Jake Atlas isn't messing around like he's back and he's ready, yeah. to, you know, you know, to kind of just, you know, continue on the momentum that you have and whatnot so jake this is kind of the part of the interview where we kind of go into you know a little bit about everything that went down with wwe etc so i kind of want to do a quick a quick recap because a lot has happened in your life right. you know you started your wrestling career 2016 or you did your training with santino's with santino's here nearby and you know 2018 you do the undercover boss episode with stephanie mcmahon which obviously led to a lot of stuff 2019 when we right before 
before we did that interview, you go off and you sign with WWE. And then, like you mentioned, the date, August 6, 2021, you get that release. So before we get to the actual aspect of the release itself, I kind of want to get in kind of into your mind a little bit and find out what it first meant to you to even sign with WWE in the first place. I mean, it was a dream come true. I to me, my entire life, and I feel comfortable, you know, saying it now, um, because I have a better understanding of of myself and just my overall vision of life or whatever, um, was that WWE was what I loved, you know. Um, with all due respect, I don't know, I, I, I didn't love the wrestling part of it um, as a kid growing up. I think it was the the glamour and the extravaganza and the WWE was just, and, and for the longest time, that's all we had, right? That's, that was the pinnacle, um, you know, your WrestleMania, your SummerSlams, like, so that was, I was just driven by that the entire time. I mean, I, I, I remember showing up to Santino Brothers on my very first day to like fill out my form and, and get training started. I remember telling my trainer and saying, okay, no jokes. What's the fast track to WWE? I'm not going to do this independent stuff. And, you know, he was kind of like, um, this is that you're in the wrong place if you think that that's how it's going to happen here. Um, and yeah, so, you know, that trajectory just, you know, obviously I fell in love with wrestling and I fell in love with independent wrestling as I started doing it and realized like, oh, it's, it's the sport that I'm in love with. Like uh, now that I'm doing it from afar as a fan, I loved the just the spectacle of WWE. And so being Mexican American also, it's very rare for us, you know, especially us first generations to achieve these goals that seem so far fetched for our parents or our grandparents or our relatives who don't think that that can be possible for whatever reason. Um, so that was also a big motivation for me. So when it actually happened and I put pen to paper, it was just a sense of, I can, I can do this. I can do, I, I, and I did it. Like, I don't know how. And, and, it, and, and when I say, I don't know how I say like a lot of my friends and uh, close friends of mine that are obviously wrestlers and, you know, still on the independent scene and, and haven't really built up traction, you know, always asking me for advice and saying, how did you do it? And what did you do? And, you know, I give them the, 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 the gist of what, what it takes to kind of stand out. But sometimes I look within and I say, I don't, I don't really know how it happened. I, I just knew that I had tunnel vision and it was going to happen one way or another. Um, so it was, it was a, a dream come true. And, and I, I thought, I mean, I was happy. I, whatever happiness was at that time, that was the happiest I ever felt at that time. And see, that's the thing is that, you I mean, you touched on so many things like you know, being the first person to, you know, in your family to kind of go for these types of dreams, because I don't think a lot of people realize, like, like you mentioned growing up Mexican, there's nobody prior. I'm sure there was nobody in your family that had the, you know, the here's the routes for you. This is the right. route that you need to take. There's nobody really that, you know, has that, you know, that background, that experience. So, you know, kind of going out there and doing it for yourself. And I do see this tunnel vision because you mentioned going to Santino's and immediately saying, I want to go to WWE because that's yeah. your goal. And there have been, you know, so many stories of so many wrestlers, so many independent wrestlers where they've taken years on the independent scene yeah. trying to make it to WWE because that was, you know, for a very long time, the only option and the only place to really go and make money and have an actual career. Right. So with that being said, when, you know, you get this contract offer from WWE, you were you surprised at how fast it came and how fast it happened to you, you know, compared to so many other wrestlers who, you know, they take a longer time to get there if, right. they, if they ever do. Right. Um, I, I was definitely surprised, um, but I also am at a time where I had already seen it happen. I was kind of already seeing it happen, you know, to other, um, to other wrestlers around my age or younger. Um, and so it, it, it kind of was, it, it was a numb feeling almost because it was, again, I come from a generation of wrestlers um where we did have it a little bit easier um and there was a, a little bit of an easier way to be able to break out and be able to get scouted 
Um, I think it was a little bit harder in the past and why it took so long for some other wrestlers under other um, uh, standout independent wrestlers to make it to WWE because it, it just was that much harder. Um, so in terms of if I was surprised at how it happened, um, I, d I don't think that I was surprised at how long it took. Um, if, it, if anything, I was, I was surprised at, at, at how, how fast everything happened after that. Um, I, I, I thought that it would have been a conversation and then it would have been a, we're interested. And then I would have never heard from them for a year, six months, but it was, it was, you know, from the minute, uh, battle of Los Angeles happened, uh, PWG in 2019, literally within that week, everything just was you know, not finalized. Cause I didn't put pen to paper until maybe months later, but I had committed to, I'm going to WWE all within that week. And it was just, it was just incredibly quick. Um, but, I, but again, in terms of, you know, I was on the in independent scene three years and then got picked up. I think if I'm being honest, it was more, it was, it kind of felt right. Cause it had already been happening to other people that were around my age um, or younger uh, that were either signing at the time with AEW or WWE. So it was, you know, that feeling was kind of just, okay, it's my time now. And then, yeah. Yeah, you definitely saw a lot of people, you know, going very many different directions. And one of them, so I wasn't surprised. Like when I did that interview with you, I was like, there's, I'm like, there's no way that he's not going to be in WWE or in AEW, like within like a year's time frame. Like I was still thinking like a year, but lo and behold, like, you know, it happened way sooner than, right. you know, than I anticipated. So now let's yeah. kind of fast forward a little bit now to the, uh, when we had our first interview, I don't think that we thought that the next interview that we were going to be doing was necessarily going to be us having this conversation. No. So on your five year anniversary, you unfortunately, you know, being a professional wrestler, you get this unfortunate news that you have been released from the company. So I kind of want to start off with how did you find out who told you and what did they say? Um, so I was at dinner. Um, it was a, it was that Friday night. Um, and I get a call from WWE Incorporated. Uh, so that must have mean that I that I don't have the contact because um, it was that was the caller ID. Um, and so I was like, that's interesting. I anyone that needs to call me, I have their name saved. So um, there's a lot there's a lot that needs to be unraveled. Um, but I'll answer your question first and then we can dive into the specifics. Um, it was John Laurinaitis, who I've never had a conversation with. Um, he called me and he said that, you know, they're executing my 30 day non-compete clause. Um, and that was that. It was a 20 second conversation. I didn't ask any questions. I was already expecting it. Um, and I kind of just numbed myself for the phone call um and it was yeah it was 20 seconds i remember picking up the phone uh showing whoever i was at dinner with and then saying i'm gonna go answer this answered it came back within 15 20 seconds um i yeah uh there's so much uh that i can go into but i'll leave it i'll leave it there for now um, I don't know if there was a follow-up question. I don't mind talking about what happened, but if there, I don't know if there was a follow-up question to not kind of throw, throw, throw you off or throw the no, no worries. So I'm just going to ask you right now. And then, so you said that you were kind of expecting it. Why was that? Why were you expecting it already? Okay. So, um, about a month or two before that happened, um, I won't get into the specifics about the actual conversations, um, but I will I'll give I'll give a little insight of what was going on uh, behind closed doors. Um, I signed a three year deal with WWE. So around June, July ish, um, I got offered a contract extension by Canyon Seaman. Um, I turned it down and I uh, for my own reasons, we had a conversation. I said, we can revisit you know, in six months. Um, little did I know that within that conversation and between that conversation and, you know, whenever 
whenever I got released or, you know, whenever everything happened. Um, as you are aware, there have been, there are a lot of changes going on with that company. Um, and so I started to get a little bit um, nervous. Um, my entire run at WWE was uh, the most, and I'm, I'm, I don't know how to word this without, um, it was probably the worst mentally I have ever been. Uh, my mental health was, was probably the worst it's ever been. Um, the last two years uh, that I was with WWE. So when I turned down the contract extension, um, I counter offered um, with, with some uh, terms of my own. Um, and I, more than anything, wanted a meeting with uh, Triple H and uh, Canyon, uh, Canyon, our conversations just were kind of at a standstill. Um, and then, as you know, Canyon ended up getting let go himself. Um, so then that put me in a weird, really weird situation. Um, I had asked Canyon for my release at some point in our conversations. Um, it was, and it was not a, I hate saying that because it's, it wasn't a, um, you know, I, I want to leave. It was more so of, a conversation of, I want to be here and feel like I have so much value and I feel like I'm not being heard. I feel like there's, I'm not being, you know, I've, I, I had requested a meeting with Triple H for six months and it, and I never got it. Um, and I think that that was the thing that was kind of worrying me the most in that May, I don't know how they see me or how they view me or how they value me. Um, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do and talk about. Uh, and I just was, was just not being, I was just given the runaround. Um, so I, you know, said, I, I want to ask for my release. Um, I don't want to, I want to stay, but, but I also, my mental health comes first and I am suffering. Um, and, uh, I was told that I would get the meeting with Triple H um, and, you know, a couple weeks pass, I took a trip to LA um, in between, you know, when I had the final conversation about what was going on with me, I took a trip to LA to kind of unwind um, and kind of just, uh, I wanted to go back for the summer. Then I came back and it was the week after on that Friday that I got let go. I don't have the answer as to whether I was already on the chopping block, which is why I was hesitant to say, to even say, you know, about me asking for it. Um, because then people will be like, well, you're ungrateful. You're, I understand the narratives that people will want to say by me saying that I wanted to quit and I wanted to leave. But, you know, you have to understand that like my mental health was, was really bad. Um, not in that given moment. I was strong. I'm strong now, but the entire time, it was it was not good. Um, so I felt like I needed to leave for myself. Like I needed to put myself first. So I just want people to understand and not and not think that I was ungrateful for you know having a job because they've been releasing left and right. But you know, I'd take my mental health and my sanity and being alive before I take uh, having a job. Or um, and I, 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 I to this day I don't know if I was already on that list um, to have been cut or if they saw went through you know Canyon's emails after he got let go, saw that I didn't want to be there, and we're like, well, we're not. You know, as you've heard, they if. If they if you don't want to be there, then you know they they'll they'll let you go. Um, so I don't I don't know. I I wish I knew that answer. I wish I knew that. Uh, and but I also don't want to ask. I've moved I've moved on completely, and you know I obviously asked it for a reason. So I was you know when it happened, I was like, okay, well then, you know it's kind of like be careful what you wish for. You got it. What's next? Um, so yeah, that's kind of how that went. So just to kind of get, you know, the timeline in perspective here. So, okay, so you signed in 2019, you signed a three-year deal. So you're looking at what, 2021, 2022? Was that when your deal was supposed to end? 2023, because it started in 2020. So Correct. 2020 to 2023. 
Okay. So during that time, you mentioned that, you know, you started at what period during this time that you're with the company, did you start to feel like, okay, you know, my mental health isn't necessarily, you know, where I want it to be? When did you start feeling the effects? And when during this timeline, did you ask to be, uh, did you ask to be released? Um, whew. <laughs> I don't think that, um, there, uh, I personally don't think that I was ready for such a big shift in my career. Um, and I don't, I didn't know how to handle pressure where pressure. Well, I still don't think I know how to handle pressure. Well, um, uh, but that's something that I have to cope with and kind of get let on. Um, the first year was magnificent, but it was also a very weird year because, you know, a pandemic happened. Um, I got COVID. Uh, I'm around June. Um, and that was something that, you know, I stayed silent on and no one really knew until now. Um, and that really affected me. It affected me. Um, I got really, really sick. Um, it affected my lungs. Um, I still feel like it's affecting me, like, um, not in, you know, like other people who have had complications, but you can definitely feel uh, different, at least I do, um, after getting it. So, I started to put more pressure on my own performances and kind of just started seeing myself kind of flee away from the wrestler that I was. Um, I feel like in 2019, I was on such a high and it had nothing to do with, you know, crowd reactions or, you know, because I feel like that's always the argument is, you know, oh, you want to be a, a big fish in a small pond. And now that you're a small fish in a big pond and you're not getting the same, it was none of that. It was, it was me. It was, it had nothing to do with, we were wrestling in front of nobody. So it had nothing to do with that. It was just an immense amount of pressure of like constantly being reminded by the fans that, you know, I shouldn't have gone to WWE and I like people just always being told something um, about, uh, about what I should have done. And just um, it really got to me mentally. Cause I, then I didn't feel satisfied with, with what I did. Um, and I also don't feel like I was myself. Uh, I think that, you know, when I, when I first, when, when, when I first met with Hunter, um, it was for my, what was it? It was for the opening of the cruiserweight tournament. Um, I wrestled, uh, I believe I wrestled Drake Maverick. Um, and that was around April, March. Um, I had not had a conversation with Hunter up until that point. I started in January of 2020. So, you know, five, four or five months later, the tournament is announced. I'm first round with Drake Maverick. Triple H pulls me aside and we have a conversation um, about my sexuality. And I think from that moment on, I just got in my head a lot about, about it. And that affected me the rest of the time. Um, I started to doubt myself. I started to realize that I don't know who Kenny is, you know, um, I don't know what, who I've been for the last, you know, at the time, 25 years, like I had no idea anything about myself. I feel like for the most part, for three years of my wrestling career, I was on autopilot. I get this big opportunity to work for the, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. I get there and, you know, it is, it's like sharks there, you know, you got to be the best because it's, there's a, a lot of great talent there and there's a lot of pressure. And I just, it really broke me. Um, and I just was never satisfied with anything that I did. I was not, I just didn't feel like myself. Um, and some of it was external. Some of it was internal. Um, a lot of external being, you know, fans and also the company itself, whether I was told, you know, don't smile because, you know, it's gay. And then being, and then being told, why aren't you smiling? Um, you know, you have a great smile and you're always happy. Like just being told so many things was just a mental battle in my head um, that I just never, um, you know, found my footing up until, uh, this year, uh, around, um, March, around March, um, I spoke up about it. I started actually training with, um, 
Roderick Strong weekly, uh, and I trained with him for about six months. One of the po most positive influences in my career so far. Um, Roderick Strong uh, told me about different uh, avenues that I could take um, to kind of better my mental health. So WWE does provide many things and they provide therapy and counseling um, and they cover it uh, and they encourage you to take it. And I remember saying, I need to do this or it's going to get ugly. Um, but yeah, I mean, up until March of this year, from March of 2020, which was only what, three months into starting there to March 2021 is when I just had a mental breakdown almost every day. I, there are days where I would cry and I, it was just an immense amount of pressure again, that I would put on myself and, and I just didn't feel like I was breaking out or being myself or getting people to get behind me. I didn't feel like I was offering anything authentic. I didn't feel, I just felt like I saw, I remember watching my matches back and I would see this Jake Atlas on the screen. And I remember just being so disconnected from what I was watching on TV. And um, yeah, uh, it, it, it was, it was really rough and tough, but, but um, I'm glad that I, you know, got the help that I got. So let's kind of rewind a little bit because there yeah. was a lot that you said yeah. there that I kind of wanted to, you know, I'm so glad that you, first of all, like let all of this out because some of it is kind of uh, a little surprising to me or a little bit unexpected. And one of them, and I know you said you weren't going to mention any details on these conversations, but I do have to ask when that conversation with Triple H happened about your sexuality, was it a neg? Did you get a negative vibe from that? Was it something where you were like, okay, is my sexuality going to be a problem here? Right. It was not negative. I can definitely say that it was not negative. Um, it was all positive, but it was, it was very, it was a, um, it was a limited kind of perspective or it was a limited kind of viewpoint on his end on what he feels it should be. Um, and so you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was not negative in the, in the sense, like it wasn't homophobic. It wasn't like, no, 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 no. It was, it was, it was, it was just a limited version of what I was expected to be and do at NXT as, you know, the openly gay wrestler that got signed to the brand. Um, so it was, you know, that itself, uh, kind of startled me a little bit for many reasons one because it's it's triple h you know and so i'm obviously you know you know yes sir and, and whatever you need um but it was also like at the time up until you know all of 2019 i was finding my footing and my identity and I, I, my character and and i was starting to be more comfortable with my sexuality and kind of being like you know what if i want to put my hand in your face like this. And if I want to walk like this, and I want to talk like, like I was finding my footing and then having it just shut down and, and, and not shut down, but like being told like, this is what we see. Um, and then being like, Oh shoot. Okay. Well then now I have to, I have to rewind and see how I can fit that, whatever that description or whatever it was. I will say though, it, it, and 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 I I want to be as politically correct and as you know fair as possible. A lot of it a lot of it could have also I think it was a 50 50 in that it was my fault as well. As the person who is you know openly gay and coming into this brand with that behind him, I could have done more for myself to speak up and and kind of join the conversation and lead them to creating something that could have been more for the brand. Uh, but I, you know, I was too late after, you know, when I realized that I could and should have done that. I was too afraid. I was too, you know, shy. I was too closed off, you know, early on. And I wanted to just do everything right that I didn't, you know, think to speak up and say, well, let's actually talk about it. Let's have a conversation about this so that we can, you know, help so many people and kind of just bring a new perspective onto the brand. Um, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, I'm not pointing fingers and I'm not saying anything negative. It's, it was a two, it's, a, it's, everything's a two way street, right? So, you know, when, when they came this way, I should have fought back and, and said, well, I think this, and I think, and I do think that they would have been completely receptive 
about it because I, I will say that WWE is more than ready for LGBTQ plus representation on their shows. Um, and I think that it just ta- it's just going to take, you know, the right person to be able to do it. So kind of like you feel like you could have maybe educated them a little bit more on how to handle it. So this is the thing that I kind of wanted, uh, you know, make sure that I got right. So did they want to amplify you as an LGBTQ plus wrestler or did they want you to tone it down? No, they they wanted me to just be a wrestler. They just wanted me to be a wrestler and they didn't want it to be mentioned or highlighted. But I, again, I took that and spun it and, and thought that I had to be a completely different person. Um, whereas, you know, I shouldn't have gone that extreme with it. But being, you know, the way I am and being so insecure and in, you know, having so many inner demons within myself to try to be freaking perfect. I just took that and went to an extreme of, well, let me be a completely different person. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and it was just, it, it's just the back and forth that really, cause soon after that people magazine reached out to them and asked them if they could highlight me and do something for me. And I remember saying, is it okay? Like, I remember, you know, they reached out and they called me and they said, Hey, we want to do this feature on people magazine. I was, I was like, hell yes. It's people magazine. Like, Ooh, that's insane. Like if they want to highlight me 100%, but I remember asking like, is, is it going to be okay? Cause I had just had that conversation about, they don't want me to, or they, they weren't expecting to highlight it in any way. So I was like, so should I not talk about it at all? Should I not take this? So and that just, it, 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 for someone who already has mental health issues, like just going through that was just diving deeper into a, into a hole of just like unknown and, and insecurity. Now, one of the things that you also just mentioned that kind of really, I guess you can say, took me aback a second was when you said that you were told by somebody not to smile too much because it was <laughs> too gay. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know if you feel comfortable telling us who said that but how did you feel hearing that and does it make you kind of like start second guessing everything that you're doing it i want i can't i the only reason why i can't say who said it is because i don't remember it and i don't know if it was like a specific person within you know the office or anything um and it also wasn't said in a way that was like it's it's bad because it's gay. It was because I'm the gay guy and I'm smiling. Like that was kind of, you know, and, and that goes back to the whole, um, you know, we just want you to be a wrestler or we just wanted you to be a wrestler. Um, so so it, it, maybe it, they were overthinking it too much or trying to bring too so. much awareness yes, to it? 100%, yes, I think so. So it was definitely not in a negative way, but for someone, but but, And this is the thing that I I wish I could have spoken up about. Nobody else there understands what, maybe besides Sonia, but she's not there. She's on another brand and she's doing her own thing with her own character and a different probably perspective about it all. No one else there is gay. So how can they understand what that means to me when they tell me that? And they don't, you know what I mean? And, and, so it was definitely a second guess of then what do I do? You know, I was told I was told to lose the sparkly jacket that I came out with because that was also too on the nose. Um, and then I was told to smile. So then I, you're stripping me of my per, of my personality that I that I already am trying. I'm already struggling to, you know, kind of fine tune and I have to start from scratch and start from zero and not and be this version of me that wasn't me. And it. It, again, it goes back to watching these matches on TV and being disconnected from the character that I saw on TV and then, and, and then being reinforced and reminded of that on the internet of this guy's boring, this guy's generic, this guy has nothing to offer, this, who is this and constantly for two years of being told that of, and, and, and just being, and me again, it's a 50, 50 and me not having the strength and the mental capacity to be able to speak up and, and and say something about it i did eventually after finding therapy for six months but it was too little too late was there anybody that you confided in i know you mentioned you know that the only person that you felt you could really probably even talk to because they were going through something not going through something similar but they were also gay as sonia so did you kind of feel like was there anybody that you confided in where you're like this is what i'm going through did they offer any advice 
Um, I kind of kept it to myself mostly. Um, I didn't want to give off any impressions and I didn't want to be misquoted or I didn't want anything to get out. And I didn't, I'm a very, I can be a very private person with certain things. Um, I love to be an open book and I love to, you know, talk openly about my life and uh, for the sake of it helping others and for the sake of story to be able to, you know, make some connections and see if anybody is out there that, but for the most part, I like to keep certain things private. And that was one of those things that I just felt like, you know, if I keep this to myself and if I just, you know, persevere, I, you know, will get it eventually. But um, I also have just always been super private about st like, you know, mental health stuff, because to me, it's a very serious topic and have had very, you know, scary situations in the past. So it's, it's something that's very dear and personal to me that I just thought, you know, I, I deal with this best within my own head um, and you know, on my own, whether it spirals negatively or, you know, I get a breakthrough and something positive happens. I get the best results when I'm, you know, dealing with it on my own. So question for you, did you reach out to WWE and say, I'm struggling here? Or was it something that maybe someone noticed? When did it, what was the moment that you said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take some counseling. Cause I know you said that they provided that for you. So right. what was that moment? And was there a specific breaking point where you, not, I don't know if breaking point is the right word to use, but right. was there a specific moment where you said, all right, this is it. Like, I really need to talk to somebody. I need to do some counseling. Right. I think that I, I, I've needed to go to therapy for the longest time before WWE. Um, I just, it, I just always assumed it was expensive and I just also wasn't ready. It was one of those things where it's a scary concept, right? And anyone who has gone to therapy can probably relate to that where it's, it's a scary concept to think, wow, am I really that messed? Am I really that, you know, off, you know, or am I really that sad or am I really that depressed that I need to go talk to someone? Um, or, you know, seek professional help. It was very scary to me. And I didn't, you know, I didn't admit that to myself until I did it. Um, and I've had plenty of conversations with, with my best friends and who are not in wrestling, who, you know, we have known me throughout time and, and have, you know, we've agreed that therapy has always been something that I've needed to go through um, person, for personal reasons. Um, and, you know, when I found out that WWE did that, I'm glad that I was actually not in a, in, you know, in one of my depressive states, I was, you know, in a more stable, mentally stable state of mind. And I said, well, let me go for it before I back out of it. Um, and nothing that there wasn't a triggering point or anything necessarily that made it happen. I think I was just, um, I had had enough and I wanted to do more. I wanted to do so, so much more with the company and with the brand. And I wanted to offer more, but I couldn't offer more if I didn't have an understanding of myself and who I wanted. So I, I took it upon myself to, to, to gather myself and, 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 and understand me and find my identity and find what I want to portray with this character and who I even am and how it's going to help me get across authentically to viewers. I felt like, it was all me. And that's the crazy thing. Like I, I, the, a lot of people, you hear stories saying, you know, they didn't know, they didn't know what to do with me. They didn't know what to do. Like, you know, WWE is bad at creative. I put my hands up and say, it was all on me. I was not strong enough to offer something to them, you know, at the time when I should have. Um, so yeah, there wasn't a specific moment. It was, it was kind of just like a, you know, time is running out and, and you, you need to do something, go to therapy and figure out what that is. And now I do want to touch on the COVID situation because, you know, you did mention that it messed you up a little bit and you got pretty sick and, you know, the lung issue and all of that. Can you tell us, you know, how long you were out for? And do you think that this, um, there's a lot of, and I, and this is what I want to clarify for you, yeah. clarify. And I think that you can clarify this for us is that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, talk online where people are saying, you know, WWE doesn't handle the COVID situation properly and all of this type of stuff. Do you think that that, that 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 you getting COVID was any sort of issue for the company in terms of like seeing you in a different light, or do you kind of want to just say like erase that misconception, and say no, that like, that did not hurt, that did not. Oh hurt no, a hundred percent, no, no, no. Their COVID protocols were always a hundred percent. 
Um, if anyone got COVID or if anyone had any, you know, issues with it, it's all, we're all adults, right? And if, if someone tells you to put on a mask, you either put on a mask or you don't put on a mask, right? And there, you will be told to do so multiple times, but it's your choice when no one is around, whether you take it off or you put it back on. So in that sense, you know, WWE, their protocols are top notch and nothing happened. They actually took very, they actually take very good care of you. Um, if you, if you get COVID pretty bad, cause everyone gets it differently, you know, and I'm no doctor, I don't know, you know, but I know for me, it hurt, it, it got me pretty bad. I was out for about a month, uh, maybe six weeks, um, that I just, you know, lingering symptoms. Um, and then also just my cardio again, we're athletes. So I didn't want to just, you know, get cleared from COVID and then, go have a match, you know, right away after, you know, my lungs got took a beating and then, you know, the match is not great. Um, so I was out for like six weeks to make sure that I was good. I, you know, jogging and, and exercising to make sure my, but I knew, and they did a lot of heart tests and they do a lot of like medical, like they take care of you and, and they were always asking, you know, how do you feel? How do you feel? Are you good to be cleared? Are you good to come back? Like, and it was more so on me to be able to that the reason why it took so long, because I was, you know, I wanted to get my cardio up and, you know, to whatever it is now, because it, it's definitely different now after getting it. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, I mean, no, I, I've, I've also seen stuff like that. But WWE is, you know, we're always great at, at taking care of us um, in during the pandemic, you know, even to this day, to my knowledge. See, that's why I'm glad that you clarified this because, again, like on the internet, there's people saying like, oh, this, you know, there's all this speculation. Oh, this person hasn't been seen on TV. They have COVID and, and right. oh, they come back and if they, if they get buried or something, it's like, oh, they're being punished <laughs> because they got COVID. So, you know, when you get, a, when you start to see a lot of that going across the board, there are people who start to believe it. So, you know, and, and you know, WWE has been very, very uh, good about, you know, going out and putting out these commercials and basically saying like, get back vaccinated, wear your mask, right. because we all want to, uh, you know, get back to touring. And, you right. know, obviously they did, but with people and all of that. So yeah. I feel like sometimes there's this big misconception of, oh, they're just putting a front, but it's yeah. good to hear that behind the scenes that they took care of you. Yes, 100%. Yeah. And, and, you know, every, everyone is different. There, are, there, are, I'm sure there are wrestlers that, you know, have gotten released that will probably speak on the topic that, you know, we'll say that, you know, it wasn't a big deal because they probably got COVID and got no symptoms. So they were able to come back within a week. Like every situation is different. And now I do want to ask you about the fact that you were asking for that meeting with Triple H and you went, I believe you said six months without getting that. What was the reason? Was it just him being too busy that you never were able to get that conversation with him? And what was one of the things that you wish if you did get that conversation that you would have said? Uh, I don't know what was it um i also could have again you know i also could have done more in my own power to have made it happen um whether it was that tv he is very busy he is one of the busiest men i have ever seen in my life you know um i don't think i ever see him walking around without an airpod because he's always you know either answering a call or you know going over a match um and i also just uh I'm, I'm very shy and, and I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm very respectful, like, and, and sometimes that can be taken kind of negatively. I know there are a lot of people that, you know, don't care and just go up to people and, and they're fine with it. But I don't know. I, again, I don't know if it's Mexican culture. Like I'm always, you know, exactly the same way. With, I, when you said you were too <laughs> polite and too shy yeah. and you wait 100% understand yeah, you. Yeah. It's like, please. And thank yous. And if, if they, if they don't look like they're able to talk, then don't bother them. You know, like that's, it's just me. And I, I it's just ingrained in me. And so I thought that the proper way was, you know, to, and, and I'm sure he was aware of it because it came from different sources. Um, and um, I, I, I wish that I would have gotten that one-on-one -on -one because I, I, it would have been all positive. It would have been all positive because I, I, there are so, I had reached a point, Denise, after therapy where I had found you know, I had, I had fixed a, a good portion of, you know, my insecurities and, 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 and a lot of, you know, internal struggles to in for my career. Um, 
up throughout that entire process and discovered so many things about me that I wanted to do. And I was confident again. And, and I guess that was the biggest thing is that I had, I had lost my confidence when I went to WWE whose fault that was, I don't know. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some headlines and, and misquoting me, but I, I don't know whose fault it was that I lost my confidence, but I just did, didn't know who I was. And I found it again. And there were so many things I, I, I wanted to ask if, for permission to dye my hair. I mean, this, and people see that people see my blue hair and they're like, Oh, it, you know, out of the rent. I've been wanting to do this for six months. I, I just wanted to do something different with my hair. But you know, when you're at WWE, you need approval. And I just, I wanted to ask for approval. I wanted to pitch a character change. I, everything that people are going to start to see unveil, you know, in this new chapter, now that I'm able to do it on my own, was exactly what I wanted to bring to NXT and bring to WWE and, and kind of just have a voice in, in that. And there were so many people rooting for me. I have talked to so many of the coaches and the producers and the writers, and they were all gung-ho for it. And I think it was just a timing thing. And I also think that I was too late. I think I was too late in discovering my myself to you know it, it happened at a time where there was a lot there's a lot of changes going on in the company that I was just I was too late for the ride and I do want to ask you about that because you did mention a little bit you know those changes in the company that you started to notice and that also was part of the reason why you asked for your release so with that being said we have heard Nick Khan talk about this. We've heard Triple H talk about this. And there's been reports about the new types of talent that they are looking for. And it's it, they're going towards more of the direction of bringing in athletes with no prior wrestling experience versus your independent wrestlers that are going out there and, you know, doing the work, trying to make a name for themselves and, you know, be trying to become the best possible wrestlers that they can be. So with that being said, how does that make you feel? And or do you, based on your experience being within the company and what you know and what you saw firsthand, are you positive or how do you feel these changes are going to affect or impact uh, not just NXT, but WWE as a whole? I think my, I don't think that it changes anything. Um, I think that everything is what you make of it, right? So, you know, someone can say, um, they're only going to hire people with blue hair, you know, for the next six weeks. Um, I don't think that there's any power to that as much as people think there is. Um, you know, there's a very powerful quote, um, you know, be so good they can't ignore you. And that couldn't be any more true for anybody aspiring to go to WWE or any other promotion. Like, it any company has standards, right? Like they all have um, job requirements, right? So you can look at it as these are the new job requirements to go to WWE, but there's always the standout performers. There's always the standout, you know, resumes that, you know, people look at and say, he may not have A, B, and C, but this D right here, that, or this, you know, whatever option it is, that is like that we can make so much money off of that. Um, I, I, it, it, there's no, I don't think that it should affect anyone's train of thought or anyone's motivation or anyone's, it shouldn't be negative in that, like, okay, well, I'm going to go, you know, work. I didn't want to go there anyway. Or, and it shouldn't be a, oh, I'm sad because, you know, I wanted to go there. It's keep hustling. Like they, they change their minds every six months, every year, every three months. Um, I, I'm positive that, you know, every, every I, I, I just try to be as positive as possible. And I try to look at everything as, you know, an opportunity for something more. So there are, I had made, I made a lot of friends um, while being at WWE. A lot of them are athletes that weren't giving opportunities to shine and be on TV. I look at this as now an opportunity for them to step up and shine because they had been taking a back seat for all the independent wrestlers that were getting signed. I mean, there's so many people that you've got to look out for. You can't just think you can't hear one thing and then have tunnel vision of, you know, that's a negative and this is you know every company is different um and and i i think that 
it, I truly don't think it changes anything, you know? Um, I, these changes started to having when I was working with the company and I didn't, I already knew that I wanted to change something about myself even before all of that. So it's, it's, it's just a matter of the work that you put in and what you want to put out. And, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see anything negative to all of that. And prior to your release, you know, there were reports that Vince McMahon, uh, John Laronitis, Bruce Pitch, Bruce Pritchard were amongst the people going over to the Performance Center to kind of like scout talent oh, from the looks of it, what was reported to, you right. know, scout talent and, you know, kind of get a glimpse of what's going down there at the Performance Center. Did you ever have any firsthand experiences with with Vince or anybody that was there to, you know, scout the talent? So I was there for the very first one um, and it was only um john laurenitis and bruce pritchard um i was there for the first um kind of um you know them coming to come see the performance center it was them too and i believe jamie noble um i it was just a regular training day for us um i actually was not asked to be a part of the vince mcmahon um training session where he would be walking around and taking a look at the performance center. Um, it was it was a select group of people. Some people were told to be there and some people were told not to be there. I don't know what the difference or what, um, I still to this day don't know what that meant or didn't mean. Um, so I don't know how that experience went um, with that situation. How do you take something like that? Because I mean, I'm assuming like if I were you and I wasn't selected to essentially be seen by Vince McMahon, who essentially is the person making the decisions of whether or not this person's going to Raw or SmackDown. And let's be right. real, if you want your career to go to that next level in WWE, you've got to be part of Raw or SmackDown. So right. kind of experience experiencing that sort of situation, did that kind of put you in a, oh man, like this is not a good thing sort of vibe? It it. I, I, it was definitely a positive and it was definitely a negative. It stung a little bit, um, but it also, it also was kind of maybe, you know, I remember looking at it two ways. Um, I remember saying to myself, they either don't want me there because um, they just, they didn't want, you know, Vince or whoever was there to see me or, and this is anyone, I'm using me as an, anyone who didn't get the call to be there. They didn't want to see us to, to not to for them to not look at us and be like, oh, that one's gotta go, or it could have been, you know, we were asked not to be there because they wanted to keep us in NXT and they didn't want, you know, Vince or whoever was there to say we want to use that one, bring them up to SmackDown, bring them up to Raw. Like, I don't know. I, I looked at it both ways, and I just, you know, the second one helped me sleep at night <laughs> to to help me realize maybe they're keeping me from, you know not moving up because they want to use me on NXT. I don't, I don't know. So now I do want to ask you, you know, we, we, we were talking about the, you know, Vince McMahon and scouting and the talent and all of that type of stuff and creative and plans and, you know, who you were trying to be for yourself and trying to figure out who you are. So were there ever any big creative plans that you knew of or any sort of direction that they wanted you to go in? No, not that I know of. Everything was pretty standard. Um, and uh, I was just, I was just there, you know, to do my part and do my job whenever I was needed. Um, I think that there was, if there was anything even remotely close to, to what you're asking me, um, I would only bring up the um, uh, Mercedes Martinez and uh, myself versus uh, Boa and Zia Lee. Um, there was actually meant to be more to that and a storyline to follow. Um, actually, one of the last matches I was supposed to have before I got nixed um, was against Boa. Um, there was just so much more that they were doing there. And that wasn't even like a major storyline, but that was something... You know, unfortunately, Mercedes got uh, legitimately con uh, knocked out. Um, and so we couldn't continue it further because she had to take time off um, and so on and so forth. But um, other than that, everything was pretty standard. And, you know, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. But it seemed like there was momentum going, um, uh, going towards doing that. Um, I, you know, I had met with creative to 
to kind of pitch this new character and this new, you know, and kind of get it going. And I kind of felt like we were going in that direction when, you know, I was winning against Cameron Grimes and LA Knight and they didn't necessarily want me losing anymore on NXT, but I was never told the reason why I was never told like what was going on. So I, I can't say that there was something going on. I think I was just a piece of the puzzle in every story that was going on to help further another story if that makes sense that definitely makes sense because when i saw you get those two back-to-back wins i was like okay maybe they're going somewhere here with jake this is great now i know we're about to hit that one hour mark i do have a couple questions for you so i'm just gonna uh i want to make sure that i'm not taking up too much of your time so i wanted to warn you uh, before (laughs) i went into these questions so here's the thing is that the second that these releases that you know when these releases happened i mean you know firsthand the internet is buzzing and the news is all over every single rest wrestling site that you can think of everybody's talking about it describe to us what those first 24 48 hours are like uh being released and having all of that buzz around your name and you know maybe some of the people that reached out to you uh things that you weren't expecting to happen and how quickly uh from that moment did you start to be able to take these bookings well i just think for more than anything i it's heartbreaking that that's it was it's become normalized. I think that was the trend that I saw when it happened. Um, I I tried to stay off social media as much as possible. I actually wasn't going to say anything. Um, I I have an unhealthy relationship with social media, um, and where it you know it it anyway. And I just wasn't going to say anything. But I I I don't. I felt like I couldn't be silent. I had to say something. Um, and I remember tweeting that Lady Gaga quote, but I, I it, it just breaks my heart how normalized it, it has become that, you know, every, when it, I'm, and it breaks my heart to say this, but I'm sure it's going to happen again, whether it's in six months or, you know, in next week or three months, like who knows? And it just, you know, it's this, it's this, it's now a ride of that these, that people go on and, you know, they say their, you know, condolences and they're like, I'm so sorry that that happened. Like, that's what breaks my heart the most in that you don't even get to enjoy your dream. Like so many people, this is your dream forever. And now you're just worried about it, you know, keeping the job. And, and, and that's what, that's what kind of sucks for me. Um, I had an immense amount of support um, via every way, mode of communication possible. And I was so lucky and happy uh, for it all. Um, I allowed myself to be sad that night. Um, I, I cried and hugged my dog and I, I just was like, I'm going to take tonight to just, to just be sad. Um, And the next day I started talking to people. Um, But I, you know, even to this day, I still haven't sat down and reflected on it all. Um, I haven't sat down and 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 kind of just like reminisced or you know, kind of come to terms with what happened. And I think the reason is because I really wasn't there that long. You know, I I really wasn't there that long. I was only there two years compared to you know other people that have been gotten let go that were there forever. I can't imagine what they must be feeling. So I kind of just told myself it's you're nothing special um to me to me like you're nothing special like it's you know you got to move on and and you know whether you you can come back one day or you can't and you can find another route and go somewhere else and you can like you can literally do whatever you want now um and um yeah i i that was kind of what that experience was like for me you know, I, I'm, I am going to say, though, is that I am glad that you allowed yourself that like one night of like sadness, because I feel like you kind of have to like let out those emotions. You know, you can't keep them bottled up inside. Yeah. Now, we've seen a lot of wrestlers, you know, when they get released, you know, they go different routes, etc. Did anybody provide you with any insight of like, hey, maybe this is like what you should do to kind of get your career, you know, back on track, etc. Because, you know, you, you did take a lot of bookings right away. Was there anybody that helped guide you or did you just know instantly what to do? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that I instantly knew what to do. Um, I think that, I think that there were definitely guides in different, you know, in different, in different ways. And there were definitely people, you know, that I talked to that, you know, have kind of helped me kind of process it all. But, you know, I took it as, 
I took, I, I, and again, I can't stress this enough. I wasn't there very long. So I, I kind of just told myself, you, you can't, you don't have the luxury of, of sitting back and allowing things to unfold. You, you got to just keep going. Like, you know, even in 2019, when I was getting buzzed, like I didn't, I have nowhere yet reached my peak and have not done any anything remotely close of like I'm fuck I'm excuse me I'm doing okay. I'm doing stuff um and so I just it was it was kind of just like a pick your pants up and 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 go figure it out like it, it's back to the way it was in 2019 you know it's kind of like it's like the Marvel, the the blip thing that, you know, when they were gone for five years, like that was me. I was gone for two years and then I'm back. Like, okay, back to how it was and and, and kind of figuring out, you know, what, what what's next. I think it's like a sink or swim moment. You either let this 100%. completely unravel everything 100%. that you've done or you're just like, screw it. What am I going to do? You know, after you can't be sad forever, essentially. And, you've got to move on. And I think one of the biggest things um, that kind of helped me cope too was just having a conversation within myself that this is a new, to me at least, it in a completely new life, you know, and it's poetic in a sense because August 6th, 2021 was my five year wrestling anniversary. Again, that's not very long, but five years in, in anyone's lifetime, so much can happen. Um, so I just said, that's five years right there that you spent trying to get to WWE. But what people don't realize is that, and as I started this interview, that was what I wanted since I was a kid. Like I knew that that's where I wanted to go. So, you know, all these years, 25, 26 years of leading up to that and then it being done, it was almost a relief of like, well, I have my whole life still ahead of me. Like I'm, I'm only 26 years old. I'm, I, I can do anything and that's not limited to wrestling. And I think that's what has helped me cope and kind of be grounded in that I'm, I, and I hate, and I, I hate saying it this way, um, but I feel free. I feel free, but not free from them. No, 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 no. And I, I don't want anyone to misquote me, not free from them. I f- feel free just from my own, um, my own restrictions and my own limitations of only wanting to be there. Now I can, I can aspire to be anything and I can do whatever I want. And that is the most peaceful and the most rewarding feeling that has come out of all of this. And, and I'm happy that I'm in that headspace and I'm happy that I'm in that mentality um, because my whole life I've been fixated on that that chapter is over. Could it be reopened in the future? I, who knows, right? Anything can happen. But that chapter is done now. And, and now it's like, what's your next, like at 26, I'm like, I'm, every time I say that, even just to myself, like you're 26, man, like there, there's no, like there's so much more you can do like that. That's really refreshing to me. And it, um, it just keeps me going every day. I love it. I mean, you have like such a good head on your shoulders and like listening to you say this, I'm like, yes, I get it. I get it. I get it. Like I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah. So now this brings me up to, you know, you were talking about your friends. Uh, one of your friends, a jungle boy, uh, he was on Renee Paquette's podcast and he said, quote, my best friend, actually, his name's Jake Atlas. He just got laid off this last round of layoffs. And so far I've had some of my best matches of my career with him. A lot of these being on the indie. So I think for me, it would be cool to do that again on a bigger stage maybe fingers crossed so i'll just ask you right now do you have any interest in going to AEW and have you talked to tony khan uh that i'm obviously interested to go to 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 AEW i have not talked to tony khan personally uh jungle boy is one of my best friends um i feel like for the past two years we've kind of had to hide we've kind of we have had to hide our friendship a little bit because we've worked we worked for rival companies um you know but he's sat here on my desk oh that is so cute for, i love for that the, for the longest time <laughs> i mean he is um uh i love him to death uh i i think that our our story is uh um 
our story is unique and i think our story is 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 great um i actually went incognito um to watch jungle boy wrestle chris jericho when i was still working for it was, up. <laughs> yeah it was uh it was when it, w- it was in jacksonville um so i took the drive up um and i went to go support him and um i you know i i'm always there for him um and you know he he came to watch me you know at gcw and he was trying to hide in front it's it's just very it's awesome how you know we're we're rooting for each other and we're in each other's corners and we just want the best for each other. And, you know, I'm, he's, he's like a brother to me and um, I am excited to see what can happen in the future. Um, I can say that not there. I am not, I don't want to say anything uh, out of context because I don't want to um, lie about anything. Um, I just, I just want to say that, you know, uh, Jungle Boy is someone that I'm always going to respect and I'm always going to love and, you know, I'm always going to root for him, whether, whether, you know, we, whether we're in the same company or whether we never wrestle again or whether we like, he's doing amazing things. And I know that no matter what I decide to do, no matter whether that's in wrestling or not in wrestling, he's going to continue to support me. Um, I, I can only hope that, you know, we get some sort of opportunity to kind of uh, kind of come full circle with, with our story and with our history, because that's, that's my guy. And um, I, I love him to death. I love your guys' friendship. Like the fact that you went incognito <laughs> to go see his match. Like that is really awesome. Nobody, did anybody recognize you or were you just kind of like, Oh, this is working. No, um, uh, no one recognized me as far as like the fans. I mean, I, I had to go backstage to, kind of be away from everyone um but you know i did go out into the stadium to watch the actual match but i went way up top (laughs) (laughs) the the seats up so that i can um see and it was still a great view so it was fine I love that. I love that. Like, that is really, really awesome. All right. And BTW, like, this brings me into, like, the forbidden door, though. Like, that's the thing is, like, right now, it's so many wrestling companies working together. Like, I feel like you can, you know, the, the, the door's open. You know, there's Impact Wrestling. There's Ring of Honor, which you're going to be at. Uh, you know, we talked yeah. about that earlier. So it's like, you know, people are working together. There's a lot of options. So I've taken so much up of your time. But the last thing that I want to ask you uh, is a, kind of a two-part question, but it's, how do you see your future short term, long term right now? What are your goals? And uh, also, yeah, so we'll end it right there and then I'll have you plug your stuff afterwards. Oh, no worries. Um, short term goals is to accomplish more uh, within wrestling um, and just, you know, face new opponents and kind of raise my value again and, and kind of uh, hide my name up again. Um, in a different way, now that I know who I am and kind of show, you know, people this, this show people who I am. I don't think that I ever really got an opportunity to do that. Um, I think little by little, um, people will start to see more of who I real who, what my personality is and what I can bring to the table. And, and, um, you know, a, some things may come out of left field for some people and be like, well, I didn't know Jake Atlas was was like that or like this or can do that or can do this. Um, and I'm just, I'm excited for that. I think that's a, one of my biggest short-term goals. Long-term goals is to establish um, happiness within myself and just being able to accomplish whatever it is I want to do. Um, I want to, you know, take, I want to go back to school and do other, and, and, and just, I'm, I am, I am free from my own, from myself. I'm free of, whatever limitations I set on myself. So long-term I'm looking to just, you know, get a degree in something, get a license in something, you know, pursue acting um, and, and, and trying to get on, you know, different uh, uh, forms of entertainment. Um, I just, I, the, my dreams have gone bigger and beyond wrestling. And now it's just, you know, finding that avenue of how to get there. 
I got to tell you, like even listening to you talk about this, like I'm excited for you. Like I'm genuinely so excited for you and like what you're going to do, because like if, you know, since since that September 5th date that you eventually could, you know, essentially could start taking bookies. I mean, you've been on top of it right. and I, I have no doubt in my mind that you're going to stay on top of it and just keep doing stuff. And I just think that you have a really good outlook on, you know, the possibilities are really at your feet. Like they really yep. are. Uh, and I just believe you 100 percent when you say like I've said the same thing, make so much noise that people. People can't ignore you. And I don't think people can ignore you when you're doing the work and you're putting yourself out there. I just think it's super, super awesome. Uh, Jane, I want to thank you so much for doing this interview with me. I feel like I could have had you here for like another hour, but I was like, (laughs) all right, I I promised him one hour and look at me. I went over that time. But no, I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and talk to me and share your honest and raw story. Like it's really incredible. Um, Before we go, before we wrap up this interview, please feel free to plug in uh, anything and everything you want to plug in. Sure. Um, Right now, I'm obviously I'm still on Instagram. Um, My Instagram is at jakeatlas01. My uh, Twitter is currently at Kenny Marquez. Um, That might change soon. Um, Still working on that. Um, You can. Hey, I've got websites. Um, You can check out my big cartel, jakeatlas.bigcartel.com. Um, I'm doing cameos again. Those are getting pretty popular. Um, I'm just willing and available to any and all of my fans. Um, I'm at your will and disposition. Um, The links are all in my bios on my social media handles. Um, So go ahead and take a look at that and just just go on this wave with me because it's going to be it's going to be a good one. It is going to be a good one. Jake, thank you so much. For everybody watching, I am going to post all of those links in the description box. So please make sure to go follow Jake Atlas. Support him in everything that he does. And I just want to thank you once again, Jake Atlas, for doing this interview with me. I want to thank everybody for watching. Please do not forget to like this video, leave a comment, and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more. Until next time, I'm Denise Salcedo. This is Jake Atlas, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. See you guys.